Hello guys, welcome back to my channel. My name is Lone Vic and today I'll be showing you how to set up and play a game of Gutenberg, a game for one to four players about the invention of print. Remember that if you would like to support what I'm doing on this channel because you, well, like the videos and want to help me grow the channel, you can click the like button, ring the notification bell and hit the subscribe below the video to be notified about new videos that are coming in on my channel regularly. And right now, let's not delay anymore and dive in into the setup of this great game. So I've taken out the biggest elements onto the table already and first let's take a look at the game preparation. So the main board is already here as you can see and bear in mind that this is the side for three and four players and you need to flip the board to the other side for a two player game. You should take the two decks of order cards which are printing cards and refinement cards, shuffle them separately and place each deck face down next to the board. So I will place them here and you need to prepare a initial display of both of those cards in the number of six when you are playing a two-player game, eight if you are playing a three-player game and ten if you are playing a player game and this will be only required during the setup. Let's say that this is a three player game so I will take right now one, two, three, four, five, six, seven and eight of the refinement cards and also one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of the printing cards. I will move the other components lower right now because we need some room for this. And you also populate these spaces for the print and refinement cards right now in the beginning of the game, bearing in mind that if this is the three, four player side, this space is reserved for a four player game. So I'll be populating for three players right now, one, two and three and also one, two and three. Next you have a bag filled with ink tokens which are those little blots in different colors and you mix the baggie up and you populate all the spaces on this track remembering that this is reserved for a four player game only. So in a three player game I will be populating it like so. There we go. And the rest of those ink spots are put to the side. Next come the speciality cards, which you also give a good shuffle to. Place one on each space, remembering that this one is reserved for a four player game, and place the rest next to the board. You shuffle up all of the gears that you get with the game, and those are just a few, there are quite a lot more in the game. You shuffle those up and place one gear on each space on this track, remembering that the last one is reserved for a four player game, and place the remaining stack face down next to the board. If you are playing a two player game, you should remove the gears which have the white borders in these sections here and only use the gears with the gray borders that you can see. I hope you can see the difference on the screen here right now. So I will just randomly populate those spaces for a free player game and let's say that the rest of those gears goes here into a face down stack. Finally, we have the patronage cards and we need to shuffle those and also place them here on this track. And these two spaces, as you can see, are reserved for a four player game. So I will be skipping those. Here we go. And the rest of the patronage cards can go back into the box. You need to place the coins in a place easy to reach for all the players as well as all the type tiles. So I will place them above the board over here. Take the black round tracker and place it on the first space of the round track here 
and this is the main setup complete. Now let's take a look at how to set up the player area. Each player will need a printing house board with those three grey pieces stuck here as the axis for these gears later on, a initiative board, which is this little thingy, a player screen, which has all the actions listed and a nice graphic on the other side, and we'll talk about how when to use this later, a set of black initiative markers, and the number of those is decided on the order of play. So the first player gets seven initiative markers along with the first player marker, and let's place those initiative markers here. The second player would get eight, the third player would get nine, and in the case of a four-player game, the fourth player would get ten of those black initiative markers. You also give each player a set of eight player markers in their color, four of which go into these bottom spaces on these four tracks here, three and four, and the rest will be used later in the game. Each player also receives two discs in their player colors. One goes on the zero spot on the victory point track and the other on this first spot on the printing house board. Each player receives 10 guilders from the bank and then each player also randomly draws two character tiles and chooses the one to keep and inserts it here, and on the other side, this character will have a passive ability that's being used for the remainder of the game, making the game a bit asymmetrical. If this is your first game, or you would like an easier game of Gutenberg, you can resign from using those passive abilities and only have this character portrait as a flavor. Kind of. Starting with the first player and continuing clockwise around the table, each player chooses a pair of print and refinement card and adds them to their workshop. So for example, if I'm the first player, I would be able to choose this and this as a pair and add it here. As you can see, this player board has a space for one, two, three, four pairs of those orders, as they are called, and those pairs cannot be changed. If you've chosen this as a pair, it will remain a pair until you fulfill this order. And then the second player chooses one, then the third one, if it's a four-player game, then the fourth one, and then in reverse order, you choose again. So the fourth player, the third player, the second player, and the first player finally chooses the second order pair that they are getting, and the rest of those cards you can clean up and put onto the discard pile. And finally, the last step for the player setup and the setup of the whole game is that each player chooses three types from the type box, and these should be the ones that will help you fulfill those orders, at least ideally. So I will take an O for this order, I will take an A, for this order, and I will take an I for this order. And that's it. The setup for the game is complete. Now let's talk about the main aspects of the game in the game overview section of this video. Okay, so as you can see, I've reorganized a bit because this is how the players should keep their elements, so these initiative markers should be hidden behind the screen together with the initiative board, the player board with all the markers, all the coins and all the types and the orders are uh, common knowledge. So a game of Gutenberg lasts six rounds, one, two, three, four, five, six. Over the course of these six rounds, players will be secretly bidding initiative on these five tracks on the initiative board to perform actions here, 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 and here. So we've got five sections of the board. The player who bid more initiative in each of those rows will be taking the turn first, and then basing on the initiative, the second, the third, and the fourth player, if there is one. After everybody does their actions for the whole board, the players will be fulfilling the orders that they have, and they can have a maximum of four orders 
in their workshop and for those orders they will be getting victory points which are marked with this circular icon with this laurel kind of leaf symbol and also coins which are marked with those crosses. Players will be able to increase their specializations on the track and gain victory points for that and also those specializations will be required to refine their orders and also the ink which will be used for refining the orders. Now some of those resources are permanent and once you collect them you always have them and some of those resources have to be spent in order to be used. The types that you have in your workshop are always a permanent resource and when you are assigning a type to fulfill an order, you can use each type only for one order per round, but after the orders are fulfilled, the types come back to you. If you want to purchase a new type from the box, you have to pay some money. And this is equal to the number of types you already have plus one. So if I have four types, the next one will cost me five and you get the drift. If you have some ink blots that you need to spend in order to refine an order, you will need to return those ink blots into the baggie. So the ink blots, conversely to the types, are a one-time use resource. The levels of your specializations correspond to these conditions on the refinement cards and you don't spend them. It's enough that you achieve the required level over here. And the gears, which you will be inserting onto those three pins will add some additional modifications to your actions or some possibilities that you will be able to use within a round. Okay, so now let's take a look at how a round of Gutenberg really plays. Okay guys, so in order to play a turn of Gutenberg, there are five steps that you will need to follow. And step one is turning the gears. Now, in the beginning of the game, you skip this step in the first round because nobody has any gears here. But if, for example, I had already in the middle of the game two gears set like this, and we'll be discussing those a bit later, then you turn the top gear clockwise one rotation so that a new section is visible here next to this, which also causes this gear to turn counterclockwise by itself and moving a new section over here. And those will be the two options that you can use in your turn. So remember that each turn starts with players who have gears in their workshops turning the gears one step clockwise, the top gear one step clockwise. After everybody has turned their gears, you start the plan step of the turn. And the plan step means that you use up all of your initiative tokens that you have over here and place them in these rows. So for example, I as the first player will say that I would like to collect a new order for two initiative. I need two initiative in the ink section and I will put one initiative in every other column. And after every player is ready, we uncover our initiative boards and we compare the initiatives. And who has the most in each row will be the first one to perform the action and then the next person with the initiative number and the next. Ties are broken based on player order. So if the first player is tied with anyone, they will always go first. And one thing to remember is that if you put no initiative markers into a row, that means that you are not performing this action at all in this turn. So once everybody's uncovered and compared their initiative and we know what order we're going in in this round, we go into the execute plan step, which is step three, and we go at this row by row. If you are here in this first row and you're the first player, you will have more cards to choose from. If you're second, you will have less and so forth and so on. You choose one pair of cards that you with 
which will create a new order for you and you add it to your player board, remembering that you can have a maximum of four. And if a player has four orders already and they want to take a new one, they need to discard one of the orders they have already to make room. Now, after all the players have taken the cards, if there are any left, they are being discarded from the board to signalize that this action is finished. Next, we have the row with the inks. And here, starting from the first player, the player selects a group of inks. So we've got three right now in a three-player game. And they can collect inks starting from the left. So the first one that they can collect is for free. The second one will cost them one gilden, and this, the third one will cost them two gilden. You can choose how many inks you want, but only from a single group per turn. And then the second player goes and they can choose another group and take the first free ink or they can pay for the ink that's left in this group, for example, that the first player started. But you don't move the inks to the left to fill in the empty spaces. The prices stay the same for everybody. So you can benefit from the free inks if you want to. After all players have taken the inks, all the remaining ones go back into the bag and will be redrawn again at the beginning of the next round. Next, we've got the track with specialities. And here, starting from the first player, a player can take a card that will allow them to raise their specialities on those cards. And the way those cards work is that you can take this card and either use it to raise both of the specialities on these cards by one, like so, or you can use this card to raise a different speciality by one. So it's either two of those or one of anything. And then you discard the card because it's no more needed. After all players have chosen, remaining speciality cards are discarded from the row. And the way that those specialities work is that they are needed to fulfill the levels on the refinement pieces of your order. So for example, this order requires this speciality to be on at least level two, and this order requires this speciality to be at least on level one. The specialities will also give you victory points if they are at a specific level. Four gives you one victory point, level five gives you three victory point, level six gives you six victory points. If a speciality is at the level six and you want to increase it more, Instead of increasing it, you get three of money. And also, the specialities are linked with this track over here. You've got the Roman number two, four, five, and six over here, which means that the first speciality that is raised to two moves this cylinder one space, which gives you a reward of one ink drop that you draw from the bag. If you then raise a second speciality to level two, nothing happens. But then if you raise a speciality to level four, you move this once again and you get another ink drop. If you move a speciality to level five, you move here and you get a order that you can draft. And if you raise a speciality to number six over here, you can take one type for free from the selection. And let's go back to this icon of taking an additional order for free. How this works is that the player takes two cards from the print orders and two cards from the refinement orders and creates one pair out of those four cards and leaves it in their workshop and the other two cards are discarded. However, if you don't like the cards that you drew, you can also pay two guilders to draw two additional cards from any stack or one from each and then select from the whole combination, but still you're selecting only one pair. So this is how this icon works. So we've got this track empty as well, and the fourth track is the improvement of your printing house. Now, how this works is that you can do two things here. You can either take a gear from the printing house and place it on one of those sockets here, starting from the top, and you place it so that one of the sections is already in this marked space, and you'll be able to use this section in this turn too. But you can also, if you want, replace one gear that you took from here with another one 
from your board and discard the one that you are replacing. Or if, for example, my situation is like this, let's say, instead of taking a new gear, I would be able to take one from my board and rotate it into any position and place it back so that I'm prepared, for example, for the next round or for a different ability to be used. But you can't use this switch that you can do if the gear has been already used this round. And let's talk about this for a moment. So if I'm in a situation like this in my game, that I have two gears already here, they've been rotated in the first step, and I've got these, this and this action to select, I can do it at any time in the game I want. And to symbolize that I've used this action, I take one of my player markers and I place it on the gear. And this gear cannot be moved until I clean this marker, so it can't be removed from my board, it can't be picked up and rotated using the action that I've talked about in a moment. And you can maximum use three of those gears in a single turn, because one action on each will be marked. Okay, so let's return those gears, and obviously after every player made a selection, or didn't because they didn't have any initiative, you clear out all of the gears remaining into the discard. And the last row is over here, and this is the patronage action. And depending on the round, you will have some different abilities available. So in round one and two, you only have this box available, so you can choose one of the four actions here. Either take one order, so remember two cards from here, two cards from here, and create one pair, or increase one of your specialities by one, or get three coins, or get two inks from the bag. And whichever of those actions you perform, you put a marker on it so that no player can do the same action in the same turn. But if the round marker is, for example, here on round four, this opens up new possibilities, because apart from these actions, you can fulfill any of these patronage cards that are under the current round or left of the current round. So right now, here would be the border of which patronage cards are available. And you can take one patronage card if you fulfill the conditions. So for example, if you have a level four on this speciality and you have two types with O in your reserve, you don't spend those types you don't return them to the box, you don't lower your speciality. Same goes for this, same goes for this. But if you have to fulfill a card with an ink requirement, you will have to return those two ink drops to the bag. If you are able to fulfill a speciality card, so let's say that my specialities were on this and this level, you collect the card and keep it with you and nobody else will be getting a new card over here. And once you get to the end of this track, this is the end of the third step. And now the fourth step of the game is fulfilling the orders. And in player order, again, from the first player, players assign their types to the orders they want to prepare, and also they can refine those orders. So in order to fulfill an order, you need to fulfill the whole top card, the one with the types. So for example, I could only right now fulfill this A and O tile, and I could return it for two guilders. But if I had a red ink blot, or I had my skill on level two, I could get additional awards from the refinement. You can't only fulfill the refinement without fulfilling this condition first. This one has to be fulfilled. Those may be fulfilled if you have the possibility. So if I return one ink blot, which is red, I will additionally get two victory points for this order. If I have this skill on level two, I will get two victory points for this order as well. And if I fulfill both of those conditions, I will additionally get one coin. And if you fulfill, you return the types, you clean up the order, you collect the 
cash and the victory points and you discard the cards. And remember that each type can only be used to fulfill one order in a round. So first assign all of the types you need and then start clearing out the orders. And then the next player and the next player and the next player until everybody is done fulfilling their orders. Remember that even during this step you can still purchase additional types for money in the value of the amount of types you have right now plus one. So you can still buy some more in order to fulfill the orders that you have. And the fifth and the last step is preparing for the next round. So you refill the order cards from the stack, you refill the inks, you refill the speciality cards and refill the gears with new ones. You move the round marker to the next round. Remember that you don't refill the patronage cards anymore. There's only one of those, right? All player markers are returned from the patronage space and from their gears if they were used into here. So those four player markers should be moved. You pass the first player token to the next player in clockwise order and each player finally gives one of their initiative markers to the player who just lost the first player token, so who is now the last player. So in this game, the first player will always have the fewest initiative tokens and the last player will always have the most initiative, initiative tokens. And guys, now we can talk about when the game ends and how we score. Now, the game ends at the end of round six. And after you've done all the steps and all the printing in round six, you don't need to prepare for the next round, you just finish the game. And the victory points that you've gathered throughout the game for fulfilling orders obviously count. You also get one victory point per three coins left in your supply. You also calculate the points from your specialities raised to level four, five, and six accordingly. And you also get eight victory points for each patronage card you managed to collect. And after you sum it up, the person who has the most victory points is the winner. If there is a tie, the tie is broken to the favor of the player with the fewer types, so who has less of these. Remaining ties are broken in favor of player with fewer inks left, and if there is still a tie, then there is a tie. Okay guys, so this was a how to play and set up for a two to four player game of Gutenberg. If you are interested to see how to set up and play this game solo, there will be a new video on my channel just about this. So a solo setup, explanation of rules and a playthrough for this game. For now, I would like to thank you very much for watching. If you have any questions about the rules and what I just said here, or if you have any comments, use the comment section below the video. I'm responding to everything uh, rather quickly in there. And remember that if you liked the video, if you found it helpful and you would like to support what I'm doing here on the channel, you can always click the like button, hit the subscribe and ring the notification bell to be notified about new videos that I have on my channel. And for now, this was all for me. My name is Lone Vic. This was Gutenberg, a how to play video for a multiplayer game. And see you in another of my videos here on my channel. Thanks for watching and being here with me. Have a great day and bye bye.